Well, good morning. Thank you so much for everyone being here today. My name is Cindy Hill, and I oversee the Student Success Center here at ISU. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the Great Ideas in Teaching uh, lecture series. We've asked some of our best teachers across campus to share some of their thoughts and insights with us regarding teaching. Um, We have a wonderful group of professors who have graciously agreed to present to us during the fall semester. So I'll give you a little update. So today we have Dr. Donna Liebecker. um, And in October, we have Dr. Karen Appleby from the Sports Science and Physical Education Department. Um, We have Dr. Andy Holland from the Department of Chemistry. Um, We have a whole panel of instructors, professors, master teachers, distinguished teachers um, from across campus that will be here on November 2nd. And Catherine Black from the Department of Biological Sciences who will be here on November um, 16th. So I hope that you will all be back here in a couple of weeks to um, hear some more wonderful insights. So I wanted to um, talk to you really quickly about a wonderful opportunity that's being made available to us um, regarding service learning, and it's next week. So Thursday, September 27th, in the Student Union Building from 4 to 7, um, it's, as it says, learn how to integrate community service into your teaching and help students apply learning outside of the classroom. So sounds like a wonderful opportunity. All disciplines are invited, so... Um, Be aware of that opportunity and make others aware, too. So now it is my pleasure um, and honor to introduce to you Dr. Donna Liebecker. (laughs) Okay, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Lana, and then you can clap again. (laughs) So Dr. Liebecker is a professor of political science and chair of the political science department here at ISU. Her research and teaching cover the areas of environmental politics and international relations, with emphasis on political narrative, border studies, and sustainability. Current research includes work on ecosystem services, focusing on the political and ecological linkages between the environment and people, public and stakeholders' values, perceptions, and uses of resources, and the effects of policy narrative on perception and policy development surrounding international borders. With her research, Dr. Liebecker aims to improve decision maker and public understanding of human environmental connections and contribute to better informed conservation. Recent publications include articles in Environmental Politics, International Journal of Sustainable Society, and politics and policy. Dr. Liebecker has won numerous mentoring and teaching awards over the past decade here at Idaho State University. In 2009, she was awarded the Faculty Advisor of the Year by the Associated Students of ISU. In 2010, ASISU presented Dr. Liebecker with the Teacher of the Year Award. In 2011, she was honored as Master Teacher And in 2013, she was chosen the Distinguished Teacher for Idaho State University. Please help me welcome Dr. Donna Leibacher. First first of all, I have to switch my slides. And second of all, whenever I follow those things, I think, great. It's like a whole lead up, and now we have to go, right? (laughs) So if I mess up the technology, that notice was not part of my intro, right? (laughs) Perfect. Yay. So thank you, everybody, for being here. 
My name is Donna Leibacker, and I'm in the political science department. I'm also a pacer, so I'm holding this microphone because I'm going to move back and forth. Um, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about how I see teaching and what I think is important about teaching. And I need to put a caveat in here that I do teach political science. So a lot of my examples are political science oriented, but I think that a lot of these ideas can be applied to a whole variety of things. I was trying yesterday as I was going over my slides one more time to think about how can I bring in the biological sciences and the health sciences, and then I, I, there's no way I can do that. First of all, that's not my area of expertise. Second of all, I don't know how you guys would apply all of these concepts into your own fields. So you'll notice heavy, heavy emphasis on political science, but that's given my background. So the other thing I was thinking about when Cindy asked me to do this, I have to admit my first title was Tips on Teaching, and Cindy said, you know, maybe you should think about something else, <laughs> right? It's not really very interesting, and we all know how to teach. That's why we're here. So I sat around for, it took me, what, like a week and a half to come up with, okay, there's got to be something else that I can actually tell you guys that will be interesting, and it won't be something you all know. Because we all know, okay, you should introduce yourself on the first day. You should make sure everybody talks in class, right? All of those little tips on teaching, not really very helpful. So what I came up with was this idea of telling you guys my story, why I love teaching, and how I actually ended up, more or less, teaching um, at the university level. It is not quite that straightforward. There are stories that uh, ultimately get me to that end, but they also very much informed how I teach today. So they are examples, <laughs> excuse me, examples of where I come from and how I help the students that I work with today get to wherever it is that they want to go. So ultimately, my goal is to create communicators, which you will see as we progress through this. So that is my intro. I have notes just in case I forget to tell you guys anything. I also have a clicker. So to start off thinking about what is this idea of teachers, right? What are teachers and more than that, what are great teachers? When you look up this term in Merriam-Webster, a teacher is a person who causes others to know something. It's true. That is what a teacher is, right? However, it seems to me like there's a little bit more to it than just getting other people to know something. So, yes, you are teaching someone if you are giving them information, but that's not really what a teacher does, right? So, where do I go to next? The Urban Dictionary, of course. <laughs> Urban Dictionary, always a little more accurate on its definitions. And the Urban Dictionary says, a teacher is actually a provider of insight and knowledge. That's better, right? I don't know Miriam's issue, but Urban Dictionary, always a little bit more accurate in my world. But even looking at this, I thought, you know, we all provide information, and we provide knowledge, and we provide insight. But really, if you're a good teacher, you want to do more than just provide that stuff. You want to make students play with it, right? You want them to creatively chew on all of that information and see where they end up. So to me, a teacher, and ultimately great teachers, are ones who provide knowledge, we do that, but also in, provide insight and in, inspire new thought and who allow the expression of this thought. I think this last part here is the part that a lot of teachers time out and just don't get to. We get to the part of providing knowledge, right? Then students take their multiple choice che test, check, 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 we're good. We even sometimes get them to think about the issues. Okay, you can apply it. You can, you know, come up with examples. However, getting them to truly communicate what it is that they are thinking about and how these ideas all tie together is a much more complicated task. And I think it is the thing that all of the great teachers in my world have done. So what I want to tell you guys about is how I think we all can, should, maybe do, get to this point that you allow your students to to express what it is they are getting from this knowledge and from this insight. This is important to me. I put this picture here so I'd remember to tell you this story. This is important to me because when I was eight, 
I moved to Colorado. So I had grown up prior to that time in a very rural area of southern Illinois. And so I had a thick southern accent. And Well, maybe not thick. That's probably not fair. I had a southern accent. And we lived in <coughs> excuse me, a rural area south of Carbondale, if any of you guys know that part of the world. And I went to a small rural school. I went to a one-room schoolhouse at one point in time. And uh, class is really small. You knew everybody. It was awesome. We moved to Colorado. We're in this urban center of a huge 50,000 at that time, right? To me, that was, you know, crazy world. And I get into this classroom where there's all these people, and I don't know any of them. And on top of it all, I speak with this weird accent. And um, so we're talking one day about poplar trees. Do you guys know poplar trees? I think, oh, great, I know poplar trees. I come from southern Illinois. We have poplar trees. I can explain this. This is my entry into my class, right? So the teacher says, who can explain poplar trees? Oh, oh, me, me, right? Poplar trees are these big, beautiful trees. They have leaves that kind of look like hands, and they have these really amazing purple and, or purple, orange and green flowers. Have <laughs> you guys ever seen a tulip poplar? Really, really beautiful trees, southern, right? The teacher looks at me, and she says, no. No. Shut me down. I did not talk for weeks in that classroom, right? Because the teacher did not actually allow me to express what I knew behind these concepts. So part of teaching to me is bringing out the ideas that students bring forward and understanding how they are also correct, even if they are not the ideas that you expect them to have. So, great teachers. I've had a lot of really great mentors in my world, and as a part of that, I have made a list, mentally, until this week, of the things that I think really, really great teachers do. Number one is respect students. I think, by all means, if you do not respect your students, you are not going to be a great teacher. Number two is create community. You have to create a community in the classroom so that your students feel comfortable and create an association not just with you, but also with the other students in the classroom. Those are by far my top two. But then I think there's this other set of really important issues that we also have to consider. You have to be accessible. If you're a great teacher, you are someone who is accessible to your students. You have to set high expectations. And you set high expectations for everybody in that classroom. You do not say, well, Bob over here got a D last time he took a class from me, so as long as he gets a C, we're good, right? You tell Bob that he's going to be getting an A, and he just has to work a little harder. You have to love learning, because when you are in a classroom, not only are you going to be teaching the people who are in your classroom, but you are also going to be learning from them. They have just as much to share with you as you have to share with them. You have to be able to shift gears, I still consider myself a uh, fairly junior faculty member here, even though I'm a professor and a chair of a department, um, i.e. I'm not actually a junior faculty member here. But I feel like I haven't been here this long, I haven't been teaching that long, and yet I am constantly confronted with students who have different experiences than I do. And you have to be able to shift gears and work in greater technology, work in how they see the world to your classroom. So this shifting gear thing, super important. And I think the longer you teach, the more important it becomes, right? You have to maintain professionalism. We all have been in the classroom where the students are just about to make you tear your hair out, and you still stand there, and you still tell them they're all really great, and that was a brilliant idea, and move forward, right? Maintain professionalism. And then the last one, utilize multiple teaching strategies. This is actually what I want to talk about today. It is not, in my world, the most important. Respect and creating community are. But it is one that we can discuss. We have time to cover in a few minutes. And that, I think, helps create all of those things that are above it. So utilizing multiple teaching strategies. We're going to start with the basics. You guys are all going to know it, but just wait. We have more interesting things coming. If I can turn my page, I'll remember what I'm supposed to tell you. Great teachers. They diversify when they teach. The three biggies that we all always hear about, auditory, visual, and 
kinesthetic, right? Auditory, we all stand in front of the classroom. We give them lectures, student answer questions. It's very back and forth listening oriented. Happens all the time. Visual, we write on chalkboards, whiteboards, overhead projectors, whatever it is. We write so that students can see the words, can see the graphs, can see the map. Students at the same time come back and write essays for us, right? So they have a visual aspect to learning, to teaching. And then there's the kinesthetic part. In my intro to international relations class, we always play the game of risk, right? They apply all of these terms and ideas that we've talked about to how they actually move forward with this game of risk. So you do mobile activities. You have them create posters. They use color. They use varying forms of expression that are not auditory and visual. We have students who are learners in all of those ways, and so making sure we capture all of that in our teaching strategies is super important. Great teachers also diversify when they consider how their students think. Students think differently. By this I mean not only do they think uh, with words, with visuals, with movement, but they also think basic terminology. They think I can apply ideas. And then they think big picture, how does this impact my world, right? And great teachers are ones who say, okay, we need to actually work through all of these levels and understand how students think so that we can hit all of these varying levels, make sure everybody feels like they are engaged, whatever level they're at, but also push them, right? Students constantly need to be pushed out of their comfort zone so that they will not only have those aha moments, but will also give all those aha moments to their classmates and their teachers. Right? Students are really great at doing that. The way I look at this is my uh, stack tiers here of definition, application, and associations. So the idea behind this is we all have to start with definitions. We give students a description of the meaning of terms and concepts. We do this because we need to have a platform to start from. We need to all be able to understand what the vocabulary words are that we are using. If we use words differently, we are not going to be able to have a conversation. So we have to have this definitional base from which to start. However, really what we want students to do is not just regurgitate information and tell us exactly what it is we have just told them, but we want them to be able to apply this to the world around them. Right? We want them to use these terms and concepts and to give examples. Right? This is, I always tell my students when they take the first exam from me in my intro class that don't memorize the terms because you're not going to see any write down the term on the exam. You are going to have to be able to take that idea and apply it to a real world situation. So give me examples. Right? That is step two. And a lot of times this is where we run out of time as teachers. We give them the definitions, we have them apply it to the world, we check the box, and we move on. However, I think that there is another layer that is really, really important and that we need to push students toward. Not all students are going to do it. Not all students are going to do it all the time. It might be once a semester where you see this. But that once a semester is really, really a powerful moment, not just for the student who makes that leap, but for everybody else sitting in that classroom. So this is making linkages or connections with other ideas. Other ideas you've covered in the class. Other ideas you see in your world. Other ideas being a painting that you walked by on your way to class, right? It does not have to be a visual, or excuse me, it does not have to be a, a word. It does not have to be a concept that you can write down. It can also be something visual. So pushing students to this third level is one of the things that I think is super important as teachers. And we do this by, although we give them solid information, you also leave a lot of things really, really vague. If you leave things vague, what students will present to you is amazing, right? They come back with ideas that you never even considered. This one's important in my world. Okay, so 
You guys are all going to be my guinea pigs now. Didn't know this was a participatory talk, did you? So I want you to think about the word ship. We're going to move through these three phases of ship and see if anybody has this really creative moment at the end, right? Okay, ship. Who would like to give me the definition for ship? Oh, to send something. Very good. A vessel. So we have the vessel for transportation at sea. Again, Merriam-Webster, right? I should have put that on there. However, it also means to transport goods or people. Excellent. Ship. Give me applications or examples of ship. Amazon ships packages. This is like my classroom where I start randomly choosing people I know. (laughs) The Mayflower. Very good. Okay, we have the Mayflower. What other ships exist? The Titanic. This is where you guys have to start thinking creatively. What's that? Ship of State. Other ships? This is... um, Oh, yeah. Yes. This is Barbara in Meridian. So Hi, Barbara. You said ship immediately. I thought of a committee I'm on, which is the state health improvement <laughs> program. So, and then I had to say, oh, no, what, is it, what does ship mean? So I in- initially, you know, in my brain, I just defined the acronym. Very good. Anybody else want to give an example? A spaceship. So we have cargo ships, we have tankers, we have passenger ships, we have fishing fishing vessels, we have the Mayflower, we have the Titanic, we have spaceships, and we have dictatorships, and governorships, and friendships, and penmanship, right? All of those are also ships. If I had just given you guys the definition of vessel for transportation, how creative would that have been? You all would have said, oh yeah, well, you know, there's the, I don't know, fishing vessel, that docks at San Diego, right? However, if you don't give all of the information and you leave it a little more vague, students are going to come up with these really, really great ideas. I believe this is super important because when I was in grade school, here again, uh, it was a different teacher than the poplar tree, to be fair. Uh, We were told to go home, come back with what we see or think or what we believe a cat is, right? Okay, you're in grade school, so the vast majority of students come back with this. A small domesticated carnivorous mammal, a soft fur, a short snout, a long tail, and retractile claws, widely kept as a pet or for catching mice. Miriam Webster, right? What do you guys think? It's pretty good, right? However, you're going to have a few students who do this. Okay, Not only is this correct, but here is a picture of my cat. But maybe it's a Manx. does not actually have that long tail, right? Or maybe it is not domesticated, right? So you have a few students who do this. There was one student in my classroom who did this. What do you guys think that is? The what? CAD, computer-aided design. It was, it was when I was in grade school, so it was actually crayons. But, but that's a really great guess, right? You, today, students would do it with computers. This is actually not an actual photo because I did not steal her piece of paper. But this is generally what, what it looked like. This is the sound of her cat purring. Isn't that awesome? The sound of her cat purring. What is a cat? Okay, it's this, it's this, but it's also this, right? How interesting is that? So I'm sitting in grade school. This was grade school. I still remember this day, right? The teacher, of course, says, I I don't even know what to do with this, right? This is not really helpful. We're going to stop at this level. But this, this is the really interesting part. This is what we want to get our students to. And when you tell them, I don't know what to do with that, you're cutting off their communication, 
right? So they'll communicate this. They'll communicate this. They might think about this, but they're not going to actually tell you about it. This is what we want to do. We want them to not only think about it, but also to tell us about it. Because that's where you get those really exciting moments where you're like, wow, a cat purring. Who knew you could draw a picture of a cat purring? Right? It's awesome. I have one more example for you. Uh, undergraduate this time. I'm sitting in undergraduate, and I took a class on world religions. And our professor, was he was a great teacher. He was a... He was, he was a great professor, actually. He used all three teaching styles, so he would lecture, he would ask questions, we would answer. He would write on the board, he would give us essays, and we would return, you know, give papers to him. He had us bring in objects from varying religions around the world. He would show us photos. So he covered all three teaching styles, which helped everybody in that classroom. He expected us to respond with all three styles, and students did. And you learn much better when you have access to all of those. So we get in to the, it was not the final exam, the, final, the exam on Zen Buddhism. Do you guys know anything about Zen Buddhism? Nobody's shaking their head yes. <laughs> Zen Buddhism is, it's a little fuzzy exactly what it is. Uh, there are definitions, and there are definitely examples, but it is not really 100% clear, because Zen Buddhism is kind of a way of thinking about the world around you, right? So we get this essay exam, and you know it has all these questions about Zen Buddhism. So we all read the essay questions, and we're starting, you know. Zen Buddhism, it's, you know, mostly you see it in this part of Asia and Whatever, whatever. One of my classmates gets up. He brings his test up to the front of the classroom. He puts it down in front of the teacher. It's been like three minutes. He has not written anything on the test. He takes his shoe off, and he puts it on top of his head. And he walks out. He got an A. (laughs) Because this is exactly what Zen Buddhism is, for all of you who do not know right? He got an A because he wasn't going to give that definition, and he wasn't going to give those examples. He went to that place that was above both of those, and he expressed it to that professor and was able to communicate that he really did understand what Zen Buddhism was, right? He would never, ever be able to do this again. You can't do it two tests in a row and get away with it, (laughs) right? Once that is it done, you have expressed that creative thought, Nobody else in the class could copy this and do this. But he had shown not only the professor, but the whole class, that he understood what Zen Buddhism was, and he was conceptualizing it in a way that was accurate, but way off from what all the rest of us were doing, writing furiously on that piece of paper. Right? This, this is what we want to get to. Not every student's going to go there. Not every student's going to feel comfortable going there. But really, as great teachers, what we should strive for is creating this acceptance of diversity. So we need to bring diversity into how we pass on knowledge. We can utilize all three types, right? We can talk to students. We can write on the board. We can use maps. We can use graphs. We can have students actively engage with games, with simulations, with presentations, whatever it is. When we push our students to think, we should push them to think in those three ways also. If their comfort zone is auditory, if they really like to talk in class and tell you everything they know, push them to one of the other areas. That is what's going to kick them out of their comfort zone and make them think about all of these things differently. Right? And we also need to be open to diversity of how students choose to communicate their understanding. Some students are going to communicate with words. Some students are going to communicate with writing. And some students are going to communicate by taking their shoe off, putting it on their head, and walking out of the classroom. All three super important, super accurate, and can make a difference on how everybody in that classroom understands what it is that you have just discussed.
So how do we create these communicators? I think we need to look at our teaching, need to look at how we have students think, and look at how we push them to communicate. So there's the auditory presentations, class discussions. We all do that pretty well. There's the visuals. I think most people do those pretty well, too. Maps, graphs, charts, written work. There's the kinesthetic, the simulations, the projects, the games. We even do that pretty well most of the time. What we don't always do is the second half, push them from definition to application to association. We get stuck here at application, right? And in order to make our students into communicators, to inspire them to go beyond what they would normally do, I think there's two really important things we have to do. We have to leave ideas open for interpretation. If we give students a specific definition of what everything is, they are not going to creatively think, and they are not going to come back with these ideas that push the limits as to what this idea can be. And we also have to create community. This gets back to my first two of respect your students and create community. You have to create a classroom where your student is going to feel comfortable putting the shoe on the head and walking out, right? Because how did that student know he was not going to get an F on that exam? If he had had the wrong professor in that classroom, he would have had a big zero because there was nothing on that written test, right? So you have to create a community where the student is willing to not only communicate with you as the person standing in front of the classroom, but feels comfortable communicating with everybody else in that classroom. You have to say a lot of, yes, that was really good, that was great thinking, instead of, no, that is not what a poplar tree looks like. That is when you shut down all of that communication. So, my overall conclusion about this is, as great teachers, what we all need to do is expect and accept the unexpected. That's all I've got for you guys. <laughs> Questions, thoughts, issues? Oh, good, we've got a communicator. Tom, oh, I should do this. So, since Tom is also a political science, I can answer this pretty easily. Oh, Donna. Uh, if you were in a different field, it would make it much harder. Um, I think that, oh, 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 repeat the question, yes. Um, how can we, what, what was your question, Tom? What are examples of this kinesthetic? More examples? Auditory and visual is pretty straightforward. The kinesthetic is not as straightforward. A lot of people, what they do is simulations in the classroom. Kinesthetic is twofold in my mind. I'm sure it's actually much bigger than that, but it is getting your students up and moving so if they can actively do something. I have students come and graphically draw things on the board a lot. So last week we were talking about, all of you who have taken class with me know this, we were doing consensual political culture and conflictual political culture. This is me drawing on the board. Can you see that? So every student has to pick a country and come up to the board and draw the graph. Do all the people in that country agree on what is politically good and what is politically bad? That would be the United States of America, right? <laughs> we have outliers. We have Democrats and Republicans. But we all believe freedom is good. We all believe democracy is good. I'm going to say we all believe education is good because I stand up here, right? We all have this set of things that we think is good. However, there are countries out there that do not have that. Think Somalia, right? Somalia, you are not going to find people that agree on everything. So if you're drawing Somalia, you're doing this, right? You have this group that thinks these things are good. You have this group that thinks totally different things are good. So I think having students graph things out, it brings in that visual, but it also brings in the movement, and it brings in them interacting with those concepts differently that I'm trying to think what else do we do we do in my classroom we do we do a lot of drawing on the board we play the game of risk we do mini simulations 
Um, I feel like we do other stuff and nothing else is coming to mind right now. Sure, because they have to deal with that information differently and they are up moving around, right? Oh, creating posters. Sometimes we'll do public service announcements on an idea or create a big poster. Same thing. Spectacular question. I have to admit that I have not taught a class that big since I was in grad school, and it is much harder, right? When you're dealing with 200 students, it's really easy to lecture. It's really hard to have them all write essay papers and grade 200 essay papers. So that's just your auditory to, you know, the visual writing piece. That's not even getting to the, you know, movement element. I think that you can do things in groups, which will still help to some degree, but way harder. You know, it's, um, you guys do not want to get me off on how we need to change our educational system. <laughs> but I think that students gain so much from small classrooms, right? And part of it is because you can use all of these teaching styles and they interact differently. When you have 300 students, you're talking to the first three rows. The rest of them are sitting there, supposedly taking notes. I don't know what they're doing, you know. I did throw an eraser at a student reading a newspaper in one of my lecture halls once. (laughs) It was kinetic movement I'm going with. (laughs) Right? They all remember that day. I was a grad student. You can get away with those things. So this is from Idaho Falls. This is, um, hi, Donna. Hi, I'm Cheryl. Just, and this is Barb. Um, hi, Barb. I'm just oh. wondering. Oh, it was Cheryl talking. Hi, Barb. <laughs> I'm just oh. wondering how you encourage communication from these distance sites if you teach a distance delivered class. I do not teach a distance-delivered class. However, I always guest lecture in Paul Link's distance-delivered class, so I have experience doing this. Um, Again, it's kind of like the big lecture hall. It's much harder. And part of that is that you don't have as much, obviously, as much direct contact with the students who are on the screen. So it's harder to go up and see what they're doing. So even if you are creating a public service announcement poster, you know, then the student has to hold it up. Makes it much more complicated. So again, I wish I had a really, really good idea for you, and I don't. Um, The public service announcement idea, actually, they make videos. So it's not just drawing posters, but it's videos that they, they then upload to the Moodle site. So there are things like that you can do, even with distance learning, that engage the students. But it takes a different, it takes another way of thinking about things. And I should should give you guys two more caveats on this. One, when I was putting this together, I was thinking about a uh, Science Friday that I was listening to last year, 2017, I believe, talking about how these three learning styles are actually um, not accurate and there's no scientific evidence proving that they exist. Which my reaction was, who did that scientific evidence, right? Stand up here and tell me that students don't learn differently. Because I think they do. Um, but the other thing was, there, we're now adding a fourth, which is digital and online. So there's a lot of digital and online learning, particularly with the younger generations coming up, that I think we're going to just have to be more creative about how we apply that in the classroom also. Mark. <laughs> Luckily, I teach the international side of things. I'm just kidding. We, we do talk about Trump. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, is it more difficult to teach political science today with President Trump in office? Uh, Yes, it is. However, 
one of the things, and this goes back to my creating community, one of the things that I emphasize in the classroom is, I don't care what you do outside of the classroom. Okay, I kind of do, but we're going to go with I don't. And, uh, however, I don't, I don't really care what you do outside of the classroom, but inside this classroom you will be respectful to the, your classmates and to me. And that means that you do not shut other people down. And as a part of that, they can have their idea of, you know, President Trump is the worst president ever, and somebody else can have their idea of President Trump is the best president ever, and we listen to what each other have to say, and then we move on. We do not get into big President Trump debates because we actually started to go there last week, and I shut it down. Luckily, it's an international class. I can say we're talking about China today, so, you know, let's get back to trade wars. But I do think it, I do think it makes an impact, and I think part of our responsibility as teachers is to confront that and make sure students understand that you can communicate with people who you disagree with. And respect them, even if you disagree with them. I think that's it. Thank you guys for coming.